I think the organizers have put a wonderful panel uh, to help us have a good conversation on this very important topic. Before I make my introductory remarks, let me invite actually the panelists uh, to come and join me so that it won't be so lonely. <laughs> um, first of all, Michelle Berry. Michelle is director of the Center for Global Health and senior associate dean of Global Health at Stanford University. Michelle is a senior associate dean for Global Health at Stanford. As one of the founders of the Johnson & Johnson Global Health Scholar Award Program, she has sent more than 1,000 physicians overseas to help strengthen health infrastructure in low resource settings. As a past president of the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, she led an educational initiative which culminated in diploma courses in tropical medicine, both in the US and overseas, as well as a US certification exam. Barry is an elected member of the Institute of Medicine and National Academy of Sciences, and a board member of the Consortium for Universities for Global Health, which I'm sure she will talk, us, tell us, uh, talk to us about. Currently, she's working on a proposal for a US Global Health Service Corps with debt amnesty. Michelle. <laughs> Our second panelist will be Emily Beersey. Emily graduated summa cum laude from Miami University in 2007 with a BA in zoology. She went on to earn a Master's of Public Health and International Health at the Boston University School of Public Health in 2009. Emily has work on maternal and uh, child health and prevention of mother-to-child transmission of HIV in Kenya, Ghana, Zambia, and Malawi. Emily served as a Global Health Corps Fellow in Malawi with the Clinton Health Access Initiative in 2009-2010, and now uh, is now the Global Health, uh, the um, uh, GHC Recruitment Director. In 2011, Emily will begin an advanced practice nursing program specializing in midwifery. Emily? And then we have Deo. Deo is uh, from Burundi. And uh, Deo, I'm sure you're used to this. But, uh, Deo means Zonkiza uh, is the founder of Village Health Works. Um, now, Deo has a story. After surviving a massacre at the Burundi hospital where during this genocide he was a third year medical school intern. Dio fled to New York where he arrived in 1994 penniless and without one word of English. He eventually enrolled in Columbia University and then in Harvard University School of Public Health and Dartmouth Medical School. Deo later took a hiatus from his medical training to found Village Health Works, a Burundi-based 501c3 organization founded on the human principle that all people, those, including those most impoverished, deserve access to quality health care in a dignified environment. Deo is the recipient of many awards, including the 2011 International Medal Award of St. John's University, the 2010 Women Refugees Commission Voices of Courage Award, which recognize, recognizes individuals who have overcome immeasurable odds and give back to their communities. His story can be found in Strength in What Remains which is the publication by Pulitzer Prize winning uh, write, author Tracy Kidder. I'm sure many of you have read uh, the book Tracy wrote on Paul Farmer. Dio has since returned to medical school and is still actively involved in growing the organization into a model within Burundi, Burundi and far beyond. 
Deo, please. And uh, finally, uh, we'll have Rajesh Punjabi. Raj is the Executive Director of TRTN, Health Clinic Fellows in Medical Medicine at Harvard Medical School. After surviving Liberia's civil war, Raj co-founded TRTN Health, a partners in health partner project collaborating with the Liberian government to pioneer a model community health worker system that is redefining how post-conflict nations rebuild rural public health services. A PopTech and Rainer Arnold Fellow, Raj was a policy advisor for the Liberian Ministry of Health and the Board of Directors of America, for America. He trained in medicine and public health at the University of North Carolina. This is, we're happy to, to see that. Uh, Johns Hopkins and Harvard Medical School, Massachusetts General Hospital. Raj, please join us. Thank you. Well, we look forward to a very good conversation. But first of all, just um, why are we passionate about this subject? Um, in preparing for this session, actually, last night, I was reviewing a wonderful, uh, very short video that I encourage you all to look at. It's on YouTube, and it's called Imagine. The video reminded me, actually, of a startling statistic. While we sit here and talk, did you know that one billion people around this planet will never see a health workers in their entire lives. I've been working in this field for a long time, but hearing those kind of statistics, I think it's kind of almost is dwarf what we hear. We know there is a very big shortage of healthcare workers around the world. A million four, I think, is the figure that is, um, uh, that is published. That figure only talks about physicians, midwives, and nurses, so formally trained health workers. So if we take that category, those categories of workers, that's what we're short worldwide. We also know that the majority, the biggest part of that shortage, is in the region of the world that carries the biggest burden of disease, which is Africa. So Africa has a very large burden of disease, but only has a minimal uh, percentage of health workers. So I think these are compelling figures that call our attention to this problem. I was saying earlier that we are not going to succeed any development work whether it's in health, whether it's in education, whether it's in environment, all of these subjects that we are interested, if we don't find some ways of dealing with the issue of shortage of healthcare workers. And I think what has happened actually throughout the year, in my opinion, we are about 30 years late putting this on the table. I think we've actually made incredible progress in just about five years. It was about 12 years ago that a report called the Joint Learning Initiative, which was commissioned by the World Bank, Rockefeller Foundation, um, Lincoln Chen at Harvard, looked, started looking at this. And there were working groups, there were geographic working groups, there were uh, subject matter working groups. Anyway, it came up with this wonderful report that finally said we need to pay attention to, to this. 2006, the world health organization dedicated the World Health Report on the issue of health worker shortages. In 2008, we had the first forum, global forum on human resources for health. And just two months ago in Bangkok, we had the second forum on human resources for health. So in the last few years, there's been incredible momentum in this field. And I'm just so delighted 
that we have an opportunity to have our student population engage in this. Because you are it. You are the future global health, the future development leaders. So for you to be engaged in this subject now is just the right time. So we are delighted uh, to have you here, and I'm looking forward to a very fruitful conversation on this subject. And maybe just to get us started, um, I'll start with Michelle. Um, <laughs> Uh, Michelle, you've, you've been doing a lot of work. You're far away. <laughs> You're far away, but uh, not, not too far. You've been doing a lot of work in this area, and um, the reason why I think we're so excited about the focus on human resources for health is we also start talking about health systems. For the first time, there is a consensus among the global health community that we need to pay attention to health systems. We need to do something, rather than focusing on disease or issues, we need at least to leave a legacy of strength and health systems. Michelle, my question to you is, what can you tell us about the situation of health systems in uh, resource poor areas that you've had an opportunity to work on? Uh, thank you, Pop. First of all, I, I have to echo your statement. It's just great to see this room full of uh, folks energized about this issue. Many of us have been out in the field uh, kind of lonely. Um, so it, it is really great to see um, this kind of student interest in healthcare workers. So absolutely you're on the nose Pop, about healthcare systems um, because there is a crisis um, in the developing world and we've heard it now for 10 years, 12 years, the numbers and everybody's read all the statistics. Um, but I think what's happened and what's made it so um, glaring in sub-Saharan Africa is this concept of the dual burden of disease. Um, so when I started out in, in medical school, I wanted to help the underserved overseas. I became a tropical disease doctor. I learned about malaria and TB and figuring that was the skill set I needed. Um, right now, what's happening in Africa with the massive urbanization um, and uh, really the distribution of disease is that no longer is TB, HIV, and malaria killing people. We're seeing a population now affected by chronic diseases, chronic diseases that need um, pro a healthcare system. They don't need quinine or chloroquine or anti-tuberculosis drugs, which is what I learned about. What they really need is a system. Um, and I think that this dual burden of disease, which is now greater than 50% of people are actually dying of cerebral vascular disease, hypertension, those kind of illnesses, rather than TB and malaria, uh, is what's made it, it truly a crisis um, in the developing world. So what have we seen while you're out in the field? We see a lot of HIV systems out there doing great stuff, PEPFAR. Um, but we're seeing internal brain drain of healthcare workers. We're seeing very vertical systems the way I was trained. Uh, we see malaria initiatives, we see HIV initiatives, we see TB initiatives, um, but we're not talking to each other. Um, so I think what the emphasis is now on is how do we get those um, different vertical systems talking to each other, sharing vehicles, sharing resources, um, we all know the brain drain of 25% of physicians over in the United States, but what about that internal brain drain when an NGO comes in, uh, when an HIV program comes in and diverts healthcare resources? So I think this is, um, even though it's been put on the map and, and the usual statistics are out there that, you know, there's brain drain over to the UK and the US, I think the real hidden issues now are not are really chronic non-communicable diseases how do we attack them how do we give ongoing health care in a horizontal fashion yeah uh, keep that in mind i think this this we're going to come back to this a little bit because this this whole issues of systems and system strengthening and system versus diseases is going to keep coming up again because uh, where we have difficulty actually is the funding does come in these streams of malaria, HIV, and so forth. Um, 
You know, there has been a global mobilization about trying to, to do something about this. Uh, one of those initiatives is the Global Health Corps. Um, I'd like to ask Emily to tell us a little bit about uh, the Global Health Corps and how it came together, and specifically about some of the organization's effort to address these human resources for health. Sure, thank you so much, Pat. Um, so Global Health Corps is, um, came to be about three years ago um, at a conference much like the one you're at today. Um, it was uh, the AIDS 2031 um, Young Leaders Summit hosted by UNAIDS and Google. And it came together actually by um, six 20-somethings um, who were sitting at a table and found a common commitment that it's our generation that needs to build a world where all people have access to health. And the people at the table were two young, talented tech folks from Google, um, two young women who were inspired by work that they had done working with health organizations in developing countries, and then two young leaders who were leading an AIDS campaign on their campus. So I think that's probably pretty similar to the tables that are in this room. And they came together and saw a commitment. They saw a desire to make a change. And then they saw two very specific needs. They saw needs in terms of the health disparities that are out there between the rich and the poor and the access that those um, folks have to um, health services. And then they also saw a need in terms of there are a bunch of young, passionate people who want to get involved, but don't necessarily have a tangible way to do it if they're not a doctor, if they're not a nurse. And so what Global Health Corps is about is, is helping young people to realize that you don't have to be a doctor or a nurse to be a human resource for health. And so Global Health Corps came together through um, fantastic advisors like Michelle Berry. Um, and the aim of, the, of Global Health Corps is to mobilize a global community of emerging leaders to build the movement for global health equity. And they do this by providing paid fellowships um, for one year to individuals from diverse backgrounds um, and, and diverse disciplines. So we're looking for individuals who are skilled in communications, in education, in engineering, in business, in finance, in, in public health, in research. Um, and we, we place you with a fantastic organization um, like Deo's and like Raj's. They're actually, um, we work with both of their organizations and place fellows within these inspiring organizations to develop um, into leaders. Um, and so we place young people from diverse disciplines within a, a one-year fellowship program where they're attacking issues that have been identified by the partner organization, um, like Deo's Village Health Works, um, and are attacking needs that have been identified by the community. And so, you know, we have Bethany, who was a data analyst at Google, who came together with her fellowship partner, Marjorie, who was a business manager at a school in, Ro in Rwanda. And now they're working with Partners in Health to advise the Ministry of Health in Rwanda on how they can introduce performance management and management training among the healthcare workforce in Rwanda. So it really is, Global Health Corps is really an opportunity to engage our generation um, from people of all skill sets to bring you in and get you working on these issues using the skills that you have, have really um, developed through your undergraduate or graduate degrees um, and, and allowing you to apply those to the, to the real challenges that are in the field. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Emily, uh, one thing is for sure that if we were only to train doctors midwives and nurses, that still would not be enough to cover the needs for most of the countries around the world. <coughs> there are 57 countries identified by WHO as being in crisis mode when it comes to shortage of healthcare workers. So this, I think, is inspiring all of us to pay a lot more attention to community health workers. And I'd like to bring Deo in that conversation because Deo is one of those leaders who recently created an organization that focused on the role of community health workers. And your organization currently has 50 volunteer workers working in your home village, I believe. Can you tell us a little bit about that initiative? Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Um, I would actually like to go back to what uh, Michelle Bird just said 
in terms of working uh, in the countries, uh, um, uh, mostly in Africa, about NGOs. Um, I think uh, we all have noticed something that is uh, quite troubling. So many NGOs in so many countries, and almost in each country, for example, uh, in Burundi, hundreds of them, and uh, uh, growing exponentially, and yet you have an exponential growth of problems. And then you wonder why. It's not like uh, um, resources that are, are lacking. It's uh, really the lack of understanding what we are doing, the value of human life. Are we there for ourselves or for the people we are serving? That is one question. Uh, another issue has always been we talk to those who are high up, not those who are at the bottom. And those who are at the bottom are precisely the ones that we talk are the country, uh, the people of the country, like Burundi, a country where that is called a Francophone country, by the way, and yet uh, probably less than 3% of the population can speak a word of French. Uh, where do you put 97% of the population? Anyways, that uh, um, uh, has been an issue uh, for us working at Village Health Works. And we went into the rural areas and we talked to community members. Well, what we saw, we didn't go there as experts. First, as listeners, and we sat down with people who actually said, we are dying and no one is around to help us. If you cannot pay, you basically die in the hands of witchcraft doctors. And if you have something, that means you have sold your own land, which is what every family member depends on to grow food for their children. So what's left? So um, they talked, we talked, and uh, we listened to each other. Uh, and despite the history, the past of that country, what we have realized was that However different each one is life experience was or has been for one reason or another, everyone had realized that they have more that unites them than divides them. So they came together and uh, we said, so what? We need to build a health center and that was built on their own land which they donated not only that, we were broke, we didn't have money, and uh, we talked to community members who were all ready to make bricks and uh, uh, dig stones, which they carried on their own hand. Um, and, um, uh, and this is how we, we, we started mobilizing the community, and it was not really that hard when you talk to people who are suffering. So it's a, it makes sense that uh, you don't have really uh, to spend much time uh, telling them about it. This is how we, we started it. So this is about community health workers. We talk about 50 uh, of them, but it's actually more than that because uh, um, we selected the community health workers from those who were actively involved in building their own clinic. Uh, they were not chosen by the, the patients. So this is how we started doing that. And of course, we had also learned from uh, uh, other people like Partners in Health who had uh, you know, come up with this uh, uh, model in, uh, in Haiti in different places. The only difference was that, of course, uh, we didn't have money uh, to pay community health workers, so they were mostly volunteers. So this is how we started. Yeah. I'd like to ask just a follow-up question on that, especially because our, our student population is very interested in the use of technology. And this is one area of opportunity, is having to do with identifying, recording, keeping track of these workers. In, in our experience, unfortunately, in most cases, we don't have systems to even track these workers. Because when we talk about our health information system, our health workforce system, it's only those official quote unquote workers. Is the, are you able to actually track or document uh, your health workers sort of a, in, a, in a system? I know Rwanda is, Rwanda, your neighboring countries, is doing a lot of work in that, but uh, is this a challenge that you face? Uh, we, we do, uh, we still have, uh, um, uh, we are working on uh, uh, a lot of these issues uh, using our electronic medical record and uh, trying to 
um, uh, uh, figure out exactly how to uh, work better in our system, uh, but uh, we still have a long way to go. To go. Um, uh, it's uh, just the beginning um, of the project, uh, but, uh, but we are moving faster than actually we um, thought uh, things were going. So. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, there's a statistic that you all hear all the time, that Africa bears 24% of the burden of disease, yet it only has 3% of the health workforce. Furthermore, it's only responsible for 1% of the world expenditures in health. Um, Raj, you working, uh, you are from Liberia, and you've been doing a lot of work in Liberia. Can you tell us how this phenomenon affects a country like Liberia. There's this whole shortage of health workers, and especially in a country that was also war-torn. Be happy to. Um, so uh, you're right, just to share a bit of background, because I, I, I think so much about this work, as I remember attending uh, these conferences um, as a student, is about really connecting uh, at a very moral level, I think, as, as you said, Deo, and as you, as you pointed out, Michelle and, and, and Emily, the, um, uh, I, I grew up in Liberia and fled the war with my family uh, in, when I was the age of nine. Um, uh, when we were fleeing, uh, there was another line of people that were being uh, uh, were, were also uh, being pushed onto this, or trying to get onto this cargo plane. Uh, and my family was uh, able to get into the back of the hatch of this plane, and they weren't. And so when I uh, had a chance to leave the country and started thinking throughout my childhood about what I truly believed in. I think what abhorred me the most was just how unequal uh, the world is and how much that puts us at vulnerability. Vulnerability from climate crisis, vulnerability from uh, health crisis, vulnerability in the hands of violence. And so I went back when I was a medical student, and this is where uh, I learned about really firsthand what the shortage of health workers meant in Liberia uh, and what it meant for, for the rest of Africa. The war lasted 14 years and took such an impact and toll on our health system that we were just left with 51 doctors for the entire country. About 4 million people, 51 doctors. That's three times less than my entire residency class at Harvard Medical School. And in that setting, we were trying to struggle in this forest community called Zwedru to put together um, a, a to, to really to treat people and care for people with HIV and AIDS. And this is 2007. This is decade after HIV treatment had been made available, cure had been or, or treatment had been had been made available. The drugs had been available in the country, but they were sitting locked up in a warehouse in the capital. $400,000 worth of these drugs were locked up in the warehouse. Why? Not because we didn't have the drugs or had what we were missing was we were missing health workers to be able to deliver the, that care to people. And what people told us at the time was that, well, we don't have any doctors in that rural part of the country, so we've never been able to put uh, HIV, anyone in that rural parts of the country on HIV treatment. And so we started to organize. And I think this is where Deo's point comes back, uh, com coming back to Deo's point, this really has perhaps more to do, the solution to this crisis perhaps more to do with what you've already learned as students and are learning, which is about community organizing, than it might have to do with whatever profession you end up in. And I think Global Health Corps, by taking on so many folks from doctors to nurses to engineers, are showing that this has to do with really human fundamental skills. We partnered, and I, I, I as, a, as coming back from Liberia, I, uh, coming back from the war, I l linked with uh, a friend of mine uh, who I had met there who had fled the war at the same time, named Wefus Quito. And Wefus and I worked with our patients, uh, people who were suffering from AIDS, dying from AIDS, on the brink of death, and asked them what it was, what kind of system Again, listening, what kind of system would work best? And they said, we can't wait for doctors. We've already been doing that. During the war, before the war, we've been waiting for doctors. And our people have been dying. We want to take healthcare in our hands if people will give us a chance. And so we organized ourselves to form Tiatain Health or Justice in Health. Tiatain is a local word selected by our patients and community health workers, which means truth or justice. And TH in many similar ways to Village Health Works, to the work that others are doing, started to focus on building and pioneering a rural network of frontline <coughs> health workers. People who would close that gap of the lack of doctors, take healthcare into their own hands, but then partner with the public clinics 
that were unable to cope with the burden of people with AIDS with other uh, illnesses, and then start to close that gap uh, by, by training and employing, uh, and I think Deo made this point as well, hiring and employing because we were valuing local patients. So former patients themselves, while we train doctors and nurses, we do that with the government. Perhaps the most undervalued resources in, in this shortage of a million health workers in Africa are former patients themselves, who by being human and understanding the illness, the suffering, and having coped with, the Ill with, with disease themselves can actually be our best solution, uh, one of the solutions, but certainly an important one in trying to solve the crisis. And now we've worked to do that work and have started providing the first rural AIDS care in the country where, it said it could, where people said it couldn't be done before in a post-war country, and are even treating conditions like depression. Uh, not relying exclusively on doctors and nurses, but actually people with the illness themselves. Okay. Um, so uh, just uh, th that that's, yes. you know, the, the issue of, um, in terms of addressing the health worker crisis, I do yes. think that, that community health workers, I'd agree, have a, a big role to play. A big role to play. You know, um, a couple of issues I really wanted us to, to, to touch on um, before we open this to question. One was, again, reemphasizing that this is an area that is, beyond health. This is an area where we really need to pay attention to both sectors. And maybe, Emily, you can address that, because I also know you do some work in, in Malawi through this. And the other very critical area that I would like us to touch on, and I'll, I'll, I'll invite uh, Michelle to tell us a little bit, is about pre-service education, because this is directly touches you new career. So what are some of the efforts that are going on, especially in this country? Because remind, let's not forget the health worker shortage. The U.S. is projected to have its own shortage of doctors. In 15 years, I think the figure is about 130,000. We will be short of uh, doctors in this country. So do you guys would like to, to comment on those? Maybe, you Emily, first you can... Uh, um, so I think one of the major goals of Global Health Corps is to really diversify the, the healthcare workforce um, and then through that bring, bring in a pipeline uh, of young leaders that can go out, um, serve in their year fellowship, develop their skills, um, and then also develop professionally to go on to be leaders in the field. Um, and just uh, one example of individuals coming in from outside of the health space took place in, in Rwanda, actually, where two of our fellows were working with Partners in Health to build um, a hospital um, in, a, in a very rural part of Rwanda. And these fellows were coming from a procurement and logistics background. Um, and, and they were applying their skills to ensure that the few doctors and nurses that are in this rural community actually had the supplies they needed to be able to deliver quality health care. Um, so they're ensuring that there is a structure um, that provides open air so that patients with TB aren't sitting in the TB ward infecting others or reinfecting others. So they're designing um, hospitals and then procuring the materials that they need to ensure that it, it's a, a space where doctors and nurses can be effective and not be frustrated or limited by their environment. And then also um, these fellows, uh, it was Ian and Isaac, um, were working in Rwanda to also procure the, the equipment so that doctors and nurses can actually use the things that they've been trained in. They can actually, uh, instead of you know, being up against a, a system where they don't have the supplies they need, they don't have the equipment they were, they were trained to use in medical school, um, but that they have, uh, you know, the x-ray machine. Um, they have a, a generator if the, if the power goes out so that they can continue um, to provide the services. And I think this helps a lot with a lot of doctors and, or nurses end up leaving communities because they're not supported, because they don't have the supplies that they need and, and how frustrating that must be. Um, so Global Health Corps fellows were able to come in and help ensure that they had the tools that they needed. And so that's just one of many examples. Global Health Corps is now supporting 36 fellows um, in Burundi, Malawi, Rwanda, Uganda, and the United States. So not only are we addressing the issue overseas um, in developing countries, specifically in East Africa right now, but also in the US in places like Newark, New Jersey, and Boston, Massachusetts. So I think it's an, an issue that we need to address overseas and here at home. 
So I, I'm going to be very brief and add upon that because I think it's, I'm going to be real heretic and say it's not doctors, nurses, or I'm sorry, they are not even community health care workers. I think it's going to be a multidisciplinary approach. We're never going to have enough human resources. So what we're going to have to do is work uh, with a whole variety of task shifting um, folks. And so I just want to get in my little plug. We've been working with the Global Health Service Corps. They're wonderful. The pairing of an African and American going off for a year in the multidisciplinary fashion is a great prototype. I'm working in Congress now, and I have people in the back with Vanessa Carey and a group. We have a huge consortium to have a larger Global Health Service Corps that's institutionalized within the Peace Corps so that you get debt amnesty. Because I know all of you graduate with a tremendous amount of debt. Been working on this for five years. We'd like to see this get through. If you can sign the petition in the back, it would be great. But it takes this prototype of not doctors and nurses, but really very innovative IT, um, telemedicine, etc. So please sign up. The other thing is you're all involved with universities. There's a new consortium called the Consortiums of Universities Doing Global Health and Working Towards Global Health Equity. We only have 51 of your universities signed up. Please get your, um, be an advocate to sign up global health, um, to sign up the university level people to do global health. Um, I did want to get that off. And then as far as the pre-service medical, there is a wonderful program now that Eric Goosby is doing with PEPFAR. We're taking our HIV money and we're putting it into horizontal programs called MEPI programs. And you should get involved with the MEPI program in your university. It's innovational education because it's all about education. Um, and it doesn't mean that you have to become a doctor or a nurse, um, although it's not bad. We are going to have these glaring, egregious lack. Um, but just think of it in, in a way. And lastly, I want to add, Caitlin and Laura and Lila, you guys are going to get rid of the need for all our health care resources if you come up with these great innovative telemedicine kiosks, uh, long-distance cell phone, SMS texting. I, if I had to train again, I'd become an engineer. I love tropical diseases, but I think where it's going to be about is innovative next steps um, to bringing health care access to folks. Sorry. Okay. Dale, can you just touch on a little bit on challenges related to women's health? Because we know that a lot of this intervention, really it's a women-centered approach. And, and, and can you talk a little bit about that? Thank Thanks. you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. and, and thank you so much, Michelle Berry, because uh, uh, again, what we are talking about is really holistic health. It's not just uh, the, the, um, the diseases and all that. Um, we, we serve uh, more than 50% uh, 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 of, uh, of our patients are women in our clinic. And uh, about 36% are children, and guess what? They come always with their mothers who often they arrive and they are sick. So our challenges really have been uh, kind of troubling, to be honest with you, because uh, when we started, we talked to community members, and uh, most of the people who have been at the clinic doing volunteer work from day one, somehow, for some reason, have been most women. I, I actually started this uh, uh, committee of uh, uh, 12 men, 12 women and 10 men. And uh, um, um, uh, men we would, you know, talk, talk, talk. And the next day when we were supposed to work, only women would show up. So I end up actually dividing this uh, committee into two committees. And the committee of women kept going up when the committee of women, of men kept going down until we had one man left. And I asked him, can you actually join the committee of uh, women? And uh, he, because he was, uh, after all, the own chairman and all that. And he said, not a problem. So today we see 115 patients every single day. And most of them are these women who come with women's health issues and all that. And we started talking to um, friends and supporters and all that about building women's health uh, facility. Uh, unfortunately, it, it's been a, a huge struggle, and some of the people we talk to tell us this. Well, don't you think that women in Africa actually need to learn how to grow food uh, more than needing a clinic? Of course they do need how to learn how to grow food, but it's not even like learning. 
Most of them are farmers to begin with. They simply do not have the chance to have someone to teach them what kind of right food to grow. They grow mostly cassava, which is pure poison. And um, so we are stuck in uh, that way. Uh, it has been a, a serious issue. Um, and uh, we, uh, I, I think we are in the 21st century uh, when we really have to understand uh, the idea of not excluding one part of the community uh, because they are our mothers. Some people don't understand it this way. Maybe some are even wondering, what do you know about you know, women's sufferings since you are men? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I have my own experience in that. You know, I remember when I was five years old, um, my mother, my own mother was giving birth to uh, her own child. There was no one around. My role was to burn grasses so that she could see enough to deliver her own baby. When the baby arrived, she would cut the umbilical cord herself. No midwife, no understanding, no nothing. So we, see, we still see people, women, mothers, dying on childbirth as if we are 300 years, you know, like... In the past. In the past. Exactly. Okay. So th this is a huge issue, yeah. and uh, um, we've been trying to address all these uh, okay. in every possible way. I know you guys have been dying with some question, and let's try to get just two or three questions from the floor. Um, okay, it's, yep, go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Beza Work. I'm from Luther College. Um, my question is actually for all of you. <laughs> uh, I come from Africa and I understand that you know, there's a lack of uh, doctors and stuff like that. But at the same time, we have traditional medicine practice, practi 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 yeah. <laughs> practitioners. And I believe they do a great job. I'm an anthropologist and I look into like medical anthropology and like we don't necessarily have to you know, implement modern medicine. How about you know, looking into teaching these people you know, who are doing the traditional medicine into you know, implementing more of their you know, practices in order, because like, they are quite affordable and they use uh, things that are like in their neighborhood. They, you don't necessarily have to build a huge hospital or whatever you know, to kind of help the people around. So how about looking into that? Okay, let me, let me have Raj uh, answer that question. Happy to. Your, your question's about what is the role of traditional practices in, in health. Um, you know, I, I, I think s s the, the practices obviously vary from one place to another, and there are things that are known to be harmful um, in, in, uh, to health. Uh, and, and the things as controversial as, as female genital cutting, for example, which may not be a traditional health practice, but but does have an impact on health. And then there are others that um, that are, are, are quite quite helpful in some cases. Um, I I think we have a lot to learn about those roles. I agree with you. I think they're um, obviously for hundreds and hundreds of years before modern healthcare is being provided. Uh, that is quite tech technology savvy, people have been finding ways to provide healthcare and they're able to treat some conditions and not, and not others. Um, I, I, I think wor this is where really working within the context of a community-based approach to health. And that's not exclusive of working with doctors. In fact, you, you have to work. There's, not, there's only one way to get a woman out of obstructed labor. Okay, uh, and, and, sometimes that and sometimes that involves a cesarean section. You have to be able to bring the child out. And so you, you do have to have access to modern technology, and I think that's an important point to hit home. At the same time, communities can teach us, and, and working with community health workers is one group of people working with nurse practitioners or others, because often those nurse practitioners are from the villages where, where they, uh, uh, where they work in a clinic, we can learn from them the context in which that healthcare can be delivered best. Um, and so I think there's a, a major role for, for trying to understand that better. Okay. Let me take a question from this side of the table. Yes, go ahead. Um, thank you all for coming and engaging us in this discussion. Um, my question is specifically about the internal drain that Dr. Barry talked about and external drain. 
Um, in terms of like really thinking about the doctors, what are some incentives to keep them, you know, to stay there and practice? Because um, this past summer, I was in Ethiopia working with some doctors um, at a hospital, and what I learned is that you know they're making two hundred dollars a month, um, barely able to support themselves and their family, and they they learn that if they go to the uh, European countries or they come to the U.S., they can make so much more and live a better life. So what are some things that people are doing or working with governments to incentivize um, doctors and whether it's health officers and nurses to stay and actually practice and not have to, you know, look into working for an NGO or um, leave their countries? Great, great, great question. Uh, maybe you, you want have me to some perspective so on I'd it like to um, add to that is how do we bring the diaspora back? Um, that, that statistic about that there are more Ethiopians practicing in Chicago than all of Ethiopia was staggering to me, whoever the CGI person that put it together. Um, so I, I, th I think it's a complicated question because you can't mandate that people stay. You have to, people always want better professional lives, they want more money, and that's okay. So you have to build an incentive in the country for the diaspora to come back and also give value to staying in the country. And I actually think these MEPI programs are a beginning. Um, these are where you partner, there are 15 of them. Stanford happens to be one at the University of Zimbabwe, but there are many, there are 14 others. We have a five-year, $15 million commitment from NIH. And what I'm trying to do is mentor junior faculty there, give them Stanford affiliations, bring them for sabbaticals, do some of their teaching, have a visiting professor, plug in the holes. And I, and I mean, there's one cardiologist for 19 million people in Zimbabwe now. So we're, we're plugging in the holes. But on the other hand, I, I went there a couple weeks ago, 200 medical students were sitting there in their white jackets. They, hadn't had a, they had not had a lecture in three weeks. So to me, in, in the area that I was lecturing in, so to me, I think we need to think of innovative ways to partner universities, and it shouldn't just be the U.S., it should be Europe, it should be our other partners, it should be south to south, and there's not enough discussion. Um, south Africa is really stepping up to the, the role of doing this, but it's about partnering. I think that's the way we're going to do it. That's right. Do you have some perspective on it, Dale? Uh, yes. Uh, it's basically what, most of what you just said, but, uh, <coughs> you know, it is uh, absolutely troubling to see, for example, in New York City, Many of the taxi drivers are doctors from uh, different places in Africa, in Russia, and, and, and you know, in places where people, physicians are not well paid. And I think neglecting that health workforce on the part of the governments, uh, government officials and, uh, you know, because, you know, poor and all that, how actually do you make priorities? What is the value of uh, human life? And they don't come to New York to drive taxis because that's the most luxurious thing they want to do. The medical training first, it's, it's, it's hard. And when you finish, you have no tools to see your patients in your own home country. You have no medicine and you cannot even send your own child to school. And then you make a desperate decision to come to New York or LA or here to drive taxis. And being hunted as immigrant, illegal immigrant, that's not fun. So I think we really have to think about this very seriously. You are students and you have so much power than actually you think you do. Yeah. To actually make sure that all these nurses, social workers, physicians are really trained and are well paid and are also equipped with tools so that they can save the, you know, the planet, people's lives. Yeah. If we do not do that, really, that's, uh, we cannot expect any progress. It's a flight of imagination, frankly. Yeah. yeah, as you can see from these questions, these are very, very difficult um, things. It's, it's a whole thing about retention strategies. We're beginning to, st we're starting to look at it. Obviously, it's not just about money, obviously, there are many other factors. Um, people need places for their kids to go to school, they just want to practice medicine, and so forth. My own organization is actually engaged in looking at some DCE, which is a discrete choice experiment, just to see what package of incentive would retain people. We are trying it in Ethiopia, 
in Uganda and some other places, were offered a package of 15% more salaries, um, opportunity for your kids, a bank loan to build a house, compared to another package. What, but you know, you will see that it, it's very, so these are very contextual, these, these are very, uh, but it, it's not simple. Countries that have tried uh, monetary incentives have ended up regretting it because they started paying the doctors more. We, I think we've seen in Ghana, then the nurses started striking and so forth. Unfortunately, we have a chance for one last question. I'll take one from the back table there. And then we'll move to our table discussions. Is it okay? <laughs> Thank you, and it's an uh, honor to be here and listening all these projects and experience of you. Um, you guys uh, talk much about infectious disease like malaria and HIV and shortages of doctors, which is the biggest problem. Yet, uh, I didn't hear anything about the new wave of globalization and affecting and bringing new diseases as, as uh, from the environmental pollution and like aplastic a anemia, um, which is due to toxics. Um, and how, what, what is doing uh, findings to help? And your clinic, for example, if a mother comes with this child with a plastic anemia, and what do you do to address that? Because it's very expensive, you need bone marrow transplant for him to have a right of life, yet they are indigenous, they are poor, so they don't have access, no even to the system, to the healthcare system. But then um, you have to, uh, you have to face it, you have to help the child, you have to make him the child uh, alive. But what are you doing when you face that? And what is it that panelists are facing at, uh, in this conversation? because we didn't hear anything about this new wave of globalization and new waves of new diseases coming from the uh, contaminated lands and toxics and chemicals in the land. Thank you. Who, who wants to take that one? I'd be, be happy to, to try to address it. Um, I, I think it's a really important question. Um, you know, I, I think, first of all, we have to break away from conventional thinking. Uh, and this is, I, I think, the cynicism that says it's not possible to treat uh, we'll just call them diseases X, Y, or Z um, in, in certain parts of, of the planet, like aplastic anemia, like cancer, uh, like, um, uh, uh, say, in our case, uh, a country that's been uh, experienced in, in my country, 40% of people have symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder from, uh, from after a war. People said that mental health care isn't a priority. Um, it's a, certainly a priority for the people we work with. They don't say it's not a priority ever. Um, and uh, so I think, I think your point's right on that we need to, um, to, to focus on, on, on chronic illnesses, illnesses that are brought on uh, by the environment. I, I, I do think that part of the solution starts with providing excellent primary care. And I think Michelle's right, it takes a whole system to do that. It involves community health workers, but it also involves mid-level health providers that are trained not in just doing basic care, but actually trained in complex care. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we, we, one of the most important interventions, for example, uh, that, that Tiatain Health uh, uh, and its, its partner, the Ministry of Health, did in, in Zwedru um, about uh, two, two years ago was to train uh, non-physician clinicians, so nurses, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, on how to diagnose depression uh, and how to diagnose HIV. Um, so I think, I think it starts with building a really good system at the community level, at the primary clinic level. But then I think for patients like the ones you're talking about, there needs to be a way to get access to the right to healthcare through other means as well. And then we know our, our friends at Partners in Health in Rwanda have actually managed to, are doing now actually managing to treat leukemias in, not in the capital, but actually in rural Rwanda uh, for those number of patients that, that need that kind of services. So I, I think it takes both good primary care at the community level, but it also takes access to modern technology. And that, that um, you know, that you're right, the engineers are gonna be very helpful in bringing that forward. If you can do it in 45 One second, seconds, okay. And a strategic <laughs> decision on how you want to spend your health care dollars. Because we've done it the wrong way in the U.S., and you don't want that to happen overseas. That's my 
That's you it. need to make that strategic decision. Anyone who wants to continue this dialogue about that dual burden of disease that I think you're raising again, the UN is having a meeting in September, I believe, I can't remember the dates, on non-communicable diseases for the developing world. Yeah, yeah. clearly um, a, a very important topic that people are beginning to talk more and more. Unfortunately, we have to wrap up this, uh, the part of, of this and turn it on to the, the table discussion. So, um, I, I hope that we've managed to convey to you that sense of urgency that this has. And uh, as you can see there, it's, this is a multifaceted problem. Um, and there's really no simple solution. But I think we're beginning to hear this theme about a holistic approach to things. We're also th beginning to think about, you know, context-specific um, and so forth. 